Welcome to Rick's Corner. You know, um, I have a friend here named Elia who has been videotaping some of my workouts. And we met uh, by chance in a restaurant where he works one night. I walked in with uh, Ina and he was waiting tables and he saw me and he recognized me and he said, oh, I'm a big fan of the show. So we started talking, right? Yeah. And then I said, come on down and work out with me. So we had a workout and we had good times. And so I, later on, I think you suggested, why don't we tape some of the workouts? Right. So we took the phone and we started taping the chest and back and this and that, and making comments. Shoulders and arms. Yeah. yeah, and people liked it. <laughs> they had fun with it, right? Yes, they did. So uh, we did a couple of those, and then we did one actually after the workout, going to Starbucks and then to the coffee shop and hanging out. And actually, I saw those waitresses the day, and they watched it. Oh, wow. They really liked it. Yeah, they, they did. Really, so oh, we're famous now. <laughs> <laughs> At Patsy's. At Patsy's, right. <laughs> so we were talking, and I thought... He brought this up, actually. It's a good idea. Nobody ever asked me questions. I interview everybody on my show, and he said, how about I sit and I ask you some questions from a fan's point of view, because I have questions that I had before I met you, and I have questions now. It's surely a lot of you people do out there. So uh, we're going to have a fan day, and Edie's going to be the first one to do this, and he's going to sit and ask me questions about whatever, and maybe I can answer them. Yeah. And maybe I can't. <laughs> so let's do it the first one. What do you got there? Very good. Well, um... <clears throat> I just want to say it's a pleasure meeting you at the restaurant. I hope it didn't shock you on your date, Ina, when yeah. I ran up to you like an excited little child. Because I used <laughs> to read all those magazines yeah. from, from the 70s and 80s. And occasionally they show lots of pictures with Arnold and his workout partners, you know. And um, somehow I met Rich Piana at Gold's Gym and I started watching him on the internet and YouTube. And that's where I saw you being interviewed by him. And I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. I think I know this guy. Didn't he used to work out with Arnold or something? Yeah. And that's why I got really, really excited. So, I remember very yeah. well. <laughs> you spiked my food. <laughs> I did. With sugar. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, let, right. me, let me ask you, when were you bitten by the bodybuilding drug? Uh, you know, I think I was about 16 and I got the first magazines like Iron Man. And back then it wasn't muscle, muscular, uh, muscle fitness, it was muscular development and, right. muscle and power magazine by Weeder. And it was produced and uh, published out of Canada, and so they had a lot of Canadian superstars. Right. And then they had Dave Draper, which is the only one here that I remember that was in the U.S. Um, I was living in Bakersfield, and I thought, well, maybe I'll start working out a little bit. And I remember reading an article that said that you can you can pack on 20 pounds of muscle in one month. <laughs> pack on 20 pounds of muscle. Well, the word pack to me is like, okay, I just take hamburger meat and slap it on my biceps, and I packed on all this muscle, right? And then I ordered a, a York Barbell Club sweatshirt. Right. York Barbell Club was one of the first lifting clubs around. They were out of the uh, East Coast. And it was a heavy, 100% cotton heavyweight sweatshirt, which I still have to this wow. day. I paid $8 for it. It came in the mail. <laughs> I still have it. York Barbell Club. It's a collector's item. And so am I. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I started working out with the weights a little bit. At, uh, just at home, I had a barbell set, and I had a, a bench from a barbecue table, you know, that hurts your back when you do presses on it. And I, you know, I kind of started to see results within the first couple of weeks, not really knowing what I was doing, but at least I saw results. And then this was my junior year of high school, and I had a girlfriend that was a senior. She was a homecoming queen and a captain of the swim team, and um, oh, a straight-A student. She was a really, really beautiful girl, and she was a year older than me, and that was my girlfriend. Right. But I was a lead guitarist in a rock band, so a guitar player with women always has his pick, so to speak. <laughs> and so she told me that her cousins that she lived with were football players, who I knew, and they worked out at home, and I wanted to go work out with them. So I went over to their house, and sure enough, they had the barbecue pit table and the bench, and they had the weights, and they were working out for football, but I was doing stuff more on a way of bodybuilding level. And over a period of a couple of months, she looked at me and she says, your body's really changed. You're really getting, in her terms, lumpy. Right. Well, I said, lumpy to me is good. That's a compliment. I'm right. starting to show muscle. She says, yeah, but you know, it's going to be too big. I said, there's never such a thing as too big and too rich or too sexy. So uh, I continued to work out. She went away to college that year. I was a senior. Uh, we broke up because I don't think she wanted to be uh, have a boyfriend that was high school <laughs> because she was away at college, which I understand now. Looking back, I understand how do you give me up, for God's sakes. Right. Uh, I'm a 12 on a 1 to 10 back then. And so um, I continued to train at the YMCA with broken weights and broken dumbbells and broken cables. But I'll tell you guys something. It doesn't take, you don't have to have a full blast gym to build a body. Right. If you have minimal stuff and you have the mind to do so, you can build a body. So I worked out at the Y every day, sometimes until 11 o'clock at night when they finally turned the lights off and told me to go home. 
I really did. And you know, I drank a lot of milk, ate a lot of meat because right. back then that's that was the theory. You know, get a lot of protein no matter how you can. So that's where it all began. And, and you know, once you start seeing results, and you know yourself, and you look in the mirror and you see changes, you want to keep going. Right. And then I took a day off, or I took a week off, and I think. And I don't know if you guys ever thought this, but if you take time off, you always think to yourself, I, I would have only put that week in, I'd be better today. You know, time off, yeah, you need a rest, but it seems like I lost that time and I didn't want to lose it. I wanted to add it on to the rest so I could make more progress. And then I went to the Army. Right. And I did six months tour of Army Reserves and oh, I wow. couldn't, couldn't train at all there. And they have me running, so I, I got real lean from running. And I hit a gym a couple of times, and when I got, I got right back into training again. I mean, six months off was killing me. I had to get to the gym. So when was this when you got out of the army? That was in, I was in high school. I joined when I was in high school. Oh, right. You had a choice. You could either get drafted for the years or you could join the reserves for six months and then do eight years of active service. Uh, uh, that's three and a half years of standby or three and a half years of active duty as a yeah. reservist and go to meetings and camps and then four years of standby. So I chose that to get it out of the way so I could pursue a career. Otherwise, I'm stuck in the army. I can't pursue anything, you know, except lunch and, I see. and mess hall. So let me ask you, you get out of the army now. Mm -hmm. You play guitar in a band, mm -hmm. and you you have this passion for bodybuilding. <clears throat> what drove you to leave Bakersfield and come to Santa Monica? <clears throat> well, um, as I was growing up, my parents uh, used to take vacations in Santa Monica uh, on the beach or at the Kensington Hotel or Motel, and I'd go for a month. And I'd walk straight down the back of the motel onto the beach, and there was Muscle Beach. There was Steve oh. Reeves and all those guys that would hang out on us, John's Hamburger Stand. And I was in the midst of all these guys working out. And I was a skinny kid, but I liked being around it. This, I said, if I ever do anything at all, I can need to move out of Bakersfield, and I can need to set my sands on the beach of Santa Monica, and I'll stay forever. Bakersfield is like any small town across the United States. We've all had places we've come from, many of you like that. And when you move to a bigger city and you go back to a small town, it never changes. The growth is minimal. The people are nice people, but they never grow like you, like you do. Their mindset is just to take a job and do that job till the day they die and never step outside the box. And when you leave town and you make it in the film industry or in what I do, they say, well, you can't do that. You're from Bakersfield. No one does that. Well, I did, and, and I proved them wrong because you can become a big star from anywhere. I mean, right. like even Leonardo DiCaprio was born, uh, raised in a small town down here. I mean, if you have a passion to do something, you do it. So I was working at the YMCA, and I thought to myself, uh, uh, I got to get out of this, this city. This is in, oh, this was in '63, '64, and I entered some bodybuilding powerlifting meets actually, and I did well. My bench and squats were good. And then uh, in '65, a couple of wrestlers came to town, and they trained at the Y, and I said, you know, I'm thinking about getting into wrestling. And so they said, well, um, you need to come down to Los Angeles and see Johnny Mae Young at the Olympic because she trains people. Oh. I was in good shape. I mean, I had, I'll had i show pictures. I mean, I was in good shape just training. I had abs and everything. I went down to see her, and she just take your shirt off, and she looked at me and she says, I can make some money with you. She was a women's champion at the time. Got me in the ring, showed me lockups, gave me some slams. I got bruised up. Matt burned some mm -hmm. bruises. Them. I took my mom with me because my dad had passed away. <laughs> and my mom said, no, no, this is not, you're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. You can't do this. You're my son. You can't do this. You're from Bakersfield. I said, no, I can do it. And so when I came out after about an hour and I was all beat up, I took my mom to lunch. I said, we've got to get back to Bakersfield because I have to be back here at 10 in the morning to train again. And she couldn't believe I was going to do it. But I, I drove every day, five hours, back and forth, Bakersfield, L.A., every day, two hours oh each way. God. Went to work at a gym up there. I played in a band on Friday and Saturday nights to make my money, playing for dances after school, which allowed me to be able to afford the classes. My training was $25 a day, which is a lot of money back in the 60s. Correct. And then on the weekends, I played, and then you have dates, which wasn't really costly. Um, most of the time, I made the girls pay. <laughs> If I get away with it. And it's just something I wanted to do. And I got my first match six months later on Channel 5 with Buddy Killer Austin. Um, here I was seeing national TV and Jimmy Lennon was the announcer and Dick Lane was the ringside commentator. It was very well known. And they started booking me every night in different parts of like San Bernardino, uh, Ventura, Bakersfield. I back to Bakersfield again. The Olympic Auditorium. And I was in the wrestling business. Had to get a license. Had to pass a physical. You know, all that kind of stuff. You got to be accepted by the older generation like Freddie Blassie and those guys have to accept you, which... They kind of did until I, I had to prove myself to become one of the boys, and it took me about a month to let them beat me up a hundred times. Oh, God. And so, uh, and then I'd come back home. I had to go to the gym also and train for two hours with weights. So th this had to be all fit in day to day to day to day. So when you guys tell me, oh, you don't feel like training, and I don't feel like going to the gym, and I hurt, and man, I went through hell, and I did it. And I, I proved that I could do it. And um, so I got all those things going at the same time. And, 
it's a lot of work. You know, you come out of the ring of training when you don't really know what you're doing, and you're taking slams and landing on a mat that's on a hardwood floor, which is a smaller ring inside of an office. You get hurt. I broke my nose. I pulled a muscle in my trap. My, uh, I was beat up. Mm -hmm. Elbow, uh, mat burns everywhere. But if you want it bad enough, you can do it. Correct. You had that fire in the belly. I did. Yeah. yeah, I did. I really. This is something I really wanted to do, but I still had to hit the weights because that's part of what I'm selling in the ring is flesh. If you don't look great, who wants to see it? Correct. So that's that's kind of what my passion came from. My dad got me started in wrestling, taking me as a kid, and when I was 18, he passed away, and so he never got to see my my career. But he kind of introduced me to it, and um, I'm glad he did. Right, you know, that's what yeah. I wanted to do. So you get inspired from watching the greats <clears throat> like Harold Poole. Uh, John Grimmick yeah. and of course Steve Reeves and then you moved to Santa Monica. How did you end up training at Gold's Gym? This is a funny story because Harold Poole I always thought looked great and Dennis Tinarino as well. Oh wow, yes, that's right. Um, Arnold wasn't around yet but Draper was. Yeah. Um, some of the other guys, Chuck Colrus and people like that. I remember coming down to Zookies where we all used to hang out on, on, uh, at Wilshire and I went down there before I knew anybody at Gold's and I look up 4th Street because Joe Weider had his first office there. 4th or 5th Street, one of those. And I see this guy in a pair of jeans and a plaid shirt, rolled up sleeves, rolled up blonde hair, big traps and big shoulders from the back, and it was Draper. Draper. And I looked and I said, that's Dray Draper. My God, does he look good in clothes, really. Big, broad shoulders, small waist, big, he looked like a, a lumberjack, you know, right. like the lumberjack with the jeans and the plaid shirt, which later I did on auditions for, for commercials because they always had me as like a lumberjack look. So I saw who he was, and then when I finally moved here, I had to move to Torrance because I got a job with Kellogg Cereal as a salesman. Right. Now it's not a job that I wanted, but as you guys know, you have to make a living. So to get out of Bakersfield and move to a bigger city, I had to find some sort of a job. The job gave me a car, it gave me an expense account, it gave me a salary. What could be better? So I packed my car, I moved to Torrance where they set me up, and then um, I would call on supermarkets during the day and check their shelves for cornflakes and talk to the managers, get them to order in more. It was kind of a, it was an easy job. But what I found out walking around the store, I used to wear a suit or a sport coat, the managers would stop me and ask me about working out. So I started, rather than selling cereal, I'm giving them workout routines. <laughs> this just happens to me all the time. Right. And after about a year and a half, I said, I just don't want to do this job anymore. I don't want a career as a salesman. I remember going to uh, Dallas for a big convention. I'm sitting at the table in our suits, and here's the, uh, the head of the company, and the manager over here, and the general manager over here. And I poured these pills all over the table. I must have had about 25 vitamins and aminos and liver pills. And the guy looks at me and says, what are those, drugs? Oh, wow. I said, no, they're my daily vitamins. I think you spend way too much time in the gym. You need to focus on the job. I said, I'm focused on the job from 8 to 5, but when 5 o'clock rolls along, I go to the gym. I think you should go home and think about the business instead of the gym. I said, well, I don't care what you think. This is what I do. He didn't like me after that. Right. You know, you need your time to yourself. So after a year and a half, I said, I quit. I collected unemployment, and I moved to um, Santa Monica, 10th and Wilshire. That's the mecca, the head of Santa Monica uh, for 135 a month. Great apartment, right within walking distance of all the shopping. And at that time, I had been training at Bill Pearl's gym. Well, that's right. I yeah. forgot about Bill. I, I trained there for a year while I was in Torrance and met Bill and his brother Harold and a bunch of guys I made friends with who I'm still friends with today. It was a great gym. I mean, it was a hardcore in the middle of Watts, a complete black area that was South Central, and it's a it's a tough town. Yeah. You know, it's a really tough place to be, but I went every day and did my thing. And then I moved to Santa Monica and I walked into Golds from the back door and I came face to face with Arnold and some of the guys. We started talking, I started doing some benches, they saw I could lift just as much of them as not more. Yeah. And I was kind of just in. You know, I was just kind of in with it. And that became my home. I was I, I was just three minutes from the gym, five minutes from the gym. I'd go every morning, he would be there, Draper would be there, Columbo, uh, Chuck Colrus, Joe Gold, all the guys were Eddie there. Eddie Giuliani. Eddie Giuliani, all the guys. And they became friends instantly, Zabo and all those guys. Right. And so, from seeing them in the magazines, here I am working out with them. That's amazing. But the funny thing is, is that Arnold introduced me to Weeder. Weeder came over and started to talk to me, and I had, uh, shortly after I did the logo for Golds, and then I had uh, a magazine ads for like bodybuilders stay hard longer, nothing feels as good as a nice snatch, <laughs> you know, uh, muscle heads make, get more meat or something like that effect. And these shirts were cute, and I put them in Muscle Digest. And Weeder says to me, why don't you put them in my magazine? I said, because you're $1,000 a month, I can't afford it. So he says to me, if you model my products, I'll give you a full page for free every month. And I'll have my art department make it up, and he did. And so um, from that point on, I started making a lot of money on mail order because there was no internet. It was just magazines send in a coupon with a check. Right. And I was having my shirts printed, and then I decided out here in my house, I decided to build my own silk screening equipment and print my own shirts. 
I could get them done a lot faster and save me a lot more money. And so now I'm in the mecca of bodybuilding. I've got a business with Weeder. I'm working out with Arnold. Arnold introduces me to Real Blair. Real Blair gives me free protein and supplements. I model his stuff. The Blair protein. The Blair protein. And then we all started hanging out together, going on auditions. There was a pay phone on the wall, which I've mentioned. That phone would ring and no one would ever answer it if they're training. But I would answer it and say, well, this is Gold Gym. What do you want? We're looking for bodybuilders for a show over at NBC. We're looking for bodybuilders for a show for CBS. We need bodybuilders for a commercial. I'd jot down the info, tell the guys, and we'd go out and we'd audition. So the first thing we ever got was a heavy Chevy commercial uh, with Arnold, myself, uh, Reg Lewis, Jim Morris, a bunch of guys, and that was our first job ever in the business. We got $1,000 for the day. Wow. I joined SAG, Screen Actors Guild, if you guys don't know what that is. I got an agent instantly. The agent got me on the FBI TV series as a gangster, and then I did the movie Ben with the Rats. I played a gym instructor attacked by rats. And then I got a, a ton of beer commercials and cigarette spots and, uh, and then um, it's, um, variety shows like Mitzi Gaynor, Flip Wilson, Johnny Carson, Cher, all those shows which I posted on here before. Yeah, correct. And everybody was doing their own thing. Arnold went off and did Conan and someone did something else. And uh, before you know it, we were all getting jobs. And it was, it was really fun because that one day's work can bring you $6,000 in residuals. So if you work that day and you make 1000 over the whole year, you'll make another six. And if you have three or four of them going, you make a lot of money back. When you're not working and you don't have the residuals, you collect unemployment. So it rotates. You get this money from here and this money from here. And the night I was wrestling five nights so we can get money from there. And then I had my mail order business going and I was getting money from there. Right. So at the end of the day, it all adds up into one big pile. And then you, you make a pretty decent living. I bought a house. I had a couple of cars and motorcycles. And I never was one to, to throw money away or waste it. Uh, I used it on things I needed, and I had a child by then, then another child, and so um, I don't know. It just seemed to all work out. The thing is, is that my mom was always saying to me, she says, "I just, you know, I've always had faith in you." She always wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or this or that because she knew exactly. I could do anything, right? Mm -hmm. But I centered in what I wanted to do, and it was funny because here I am seeing these guys in the magazines. The next thing I know, I'm one of them, and here it is, 40 years, 50 years later, no, 40 years later, and. All that history that accumulated back then with me and them has come forward and now everybody's saying that's the best time of ever, the golden era. Correct. And it is, it was the best time. It was basic, it was simple, not too much you know, bullshit, you know? No, no, it was very simple, a very easy lifestyle. Someone wrote on one of our YouTube, what a crazy uh, time that was, a crazy life. No, it really wasn't, it was the best life. Simple. <clears throat> simple, everything was cheap, gas was 39 cents a gallon. I used to buy a dozen eggs for 39 cents. Wow. Um, people were friendly, it was free love on the beach, and there were parties everywhere, and uh, there was no pressure, I mean, there was just no pressure. I had an income, so I was okay. A lot, a lot of guys, someone said, how did the bodybuilders make money? Well, a lot of them did, and a lot of them didn't. There'd be people from, I, I knew a lot of guys from Michigan that would come out, three at a time, and they'd come to the gym in pretty good shape, they would get jobs as bouncers in the marina, because the marina was always looking for bouncers, or they'd get a job driving a truck, or one would get a girlfriend, and the girlfriend let a guy move in, the other two would move home again. Then you turn around two weeks later and three new guys would come out. It's the same pattern. I used right. to make notes of it. Three at a time, three at a time, three at a time. Two would stay, one would leave, one would stay, three would leave. And it just worked out that way. Oh my God. If I had to do it all over, I would. But if I talked to somebody today and said, look, I want to be an actor or a wrestler, I would say don't do it because it's a struggle. But at the time you're going through it, you don't realize it. It's something you just do. And bodybuilding too, it's hard. You know, people say, oh, you guys were all on drugs. Well, there weren't a lot of drugs back then. Correct, yeah. There was DECA and TEST. I think that was Anavar, maybe, Winstrol. But it was never in large amounts. It was very minimal. Uh, it was all real, so you didn't have to take a lot. And legal. <clears throat> and it was legal. It wasn't against the law. So right. you guys say, oh, you were cheating. No, we, it was that, definitely legal. You, you didn't have to have a prescription or anything. You just get it. So uh, it, it did change things a little bit. It wasn't the end result of getting the greatest body in the world because the greatest body came from hard training and a good diet. Correct. We didn't do cardio. There was no um, bikes. There was no stairmasters. There was no treadmills. It was low carbs to no carbs. And then sometimes we'd take a run on the beach on the sand for 10 minutes, you know, right. just because it was nice. And we stayed lean. I mean, that's just what it was. Um, the drugs didn't really do it. They put the little tiny icing on the cake. Correct. The polish, yeah. The polish. That's pretty much what it did. But you would cycle your carbs. <clears throat> Either do high protein, high fat, or high protein, high yeah, fat. Yeah, well, real Blair always thought of high protein, high fat, low carb, right. no carb, because the fat is burner's energy. Correct. So, and it works very well. And then Sunday would be a junk day. I remember having a plate of spaghetti, and meatballs, a jello mold, salad, garlic bread, and a cheesecake, and I would crawl away from the table on my hands and knees. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even. Ugh. 
Monday, I go to the gym, I'm five pounds heavier, full of water. By Tuesday, I'm back in shape again. Right. right. I chase it down with Metamucil at night and get rid of it the next morning. <laughs> but that's how it worked. And, and everybody did the same diet. I used to say to Zabo, I said, I, how do you do this all week long and not get hungry? He said, look, Rick, when you get to a point where your body's where you want to be, go ahead on a Wednesday and eat what you want. Go ahead on a Friday, eat what you want. But in the next two days, go back on your diet and then take three days and do it again. He says, because you're not going to gain, you're not going to get fat in one meal. Correct. You can eat all you want in one meal, go right through it. If you do it every day at the same time, you're going to get fat. So I just had a guy at the doctor's office this morning ask me, he says, man, he says, I was at 220 pounds in fat. I was eating chips and candy. Said, yeah, but you can't eat that. You know, I never had a diet, uh, that type of diet anyway. I didn't like ca- uh, junk and candy. Oh, it's more like a treat. It's not even a treat to me. A treat to me is garlic bread or sourdough bread with butter. That's oh, what I liked. <laughs> you know, or a cheesecake, you know, right, something right. like that. But candy, no. Mm-hmm. No, but it's funny because that time, um, I say this word a lot, a lot camaraderie was, was really big. We were a, a family. You Correct. could go down to Gold's Gym any time of the day at night and walk in the back door and there's somebody there that you knew. A couple of people that you knew that you'd hang out with and you'd go get coffee or go down. We had a belongerie by the gym, which was uh, 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 Basque food and Italian. and They had cheese and wine and crackers and they had a bakery and they had a nice patio with trees. And you could get some coffee and some cheese and crackers and sit out and just relax and, and talk. Or you go down to Zuki's Deli at 10.30 at night right. and we get cheese omelets and cottage cheese before we go to bed yeah. at night. Hang oh. out and talk. Tell me about this story. Is it true that uh, you and Arnold and some of the guys would go in there and eat divar an entire apple pie? Oh, that was across the street. Was it across yeah, the street? Yeah, it was on Saturday nights. I remember going with Draper and Arnold and Franco and Zane and all these guys, and we would get the pecan pie with ice cream. Right. Or a strawberry shortcake with ice cream or any of that stuff and eat the whole thing. The whole thing, yeah. The whole thing. And then, you know, Sunday was a junk day or Saturday night, but then mm. it didn't do anything because you'd go to the bathroom the next day, you'd come out, but it gave you some sugar and gave you some energy. Uh, and Arnold would do it before a contest. Right. And be- because he did, he was more ripped. Now, a lot of guys were afraid to. And a lot of you guys who compete, did you ever notice like a week later after the show, you're actually more muscular? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you're eating everything? Because your body's taking it in and it's letting you grow? When you starve yourself down for a contest, you go flat because you don't have the carbs and what it takes to do it. But the week later, is you're in your best shape, you say, oh man, I should have entered today. <laughs> because it's the <laughs> eating that did it. And he knew that. That's why he would do it the night before. Mm-hmm. And he'd do it in front of Frigno and those guys, and they wouldn't do it. No, no, you can't. There's a contest tomorrow. Well, that was the whole key right, right, to right. eat. But none of this would have happened uh, unless you had shown the desire to actually train with the big boys and really push the heavy weights. That's what got the attention. Because Joe Gold, if you saw you were fooling around, would just kick you out. Yeah, well, he wouldn't kick you out, but he wouldn't take any interest in you. Um, Joe was a bodybuilder. He was also a wrestler for a short period of time. So was Zabo. No one know that, knew that. And Joe would travel, and so did Zabo with Mae West. She had a Mae West review through Vegas where she always had muscle guys around her, and there's pictures of them together. And he did some stuff like that, but he was also a merchant marine, and that's where he made the bulk of his money. And, and back in those days, he bought property in Santa Monica and Venice, like big lots on the beach were like five grand. You know, I mean, they're worth a fortune of millions today. So he had all this property, he knew how to weld from being a marine, and, mm-hmm. and he designed, designed his own equipment. He built this gym on um, 10 or 6 Pacific, because the guys on the beach had nowhere to train really. They kicked them off the beach in Santa Monica. The city did not want them there. They said bodybuilders were uh, a menace to society because two guys got arrested for trying to molest two young girls. Well, anybody does that today, so not just bodybuilders. So um, he made a gym and he had them come indoors and he charged 40 bucks a year. Now this was maybe three, 4,000 square foot building. Right, like that. Really small, small, yeah. real small. But it had all of his equipment. You guys have seen pictures of it. The benches were designed by him. Uh, the cables were designed by him. The handles on the dumbbells I spoke about were bell handles. They were great. The saw that he used to cut the wood for the benches, I have here, he gave it to me. I've had it for 35 years. Wow. So I have a saw and I don't want to get rid of it because it's Joe Gold's. Exactly. But what happened, and this is the story, and I've told this before, I don't know if you guys have heard it or not, there would be no Gold's Gym today, and their bodybuilding probably would not be where it is today if it wasn't for Joe Gold and Joe Weider. And the reason I say that is Joe Gold had the gym. Joe Weider used the gym for photographs. So he had Dave Draper training at Gold's Gym. So when he would shoot this, it's at Gold's Gym in Venice. Nobody knew what it was. They thought this has got to be the greatest place in the world. Through Art Zeller, right? Art Zeller was a photographer, a great photographer. Yeah. And so when they would see these in the magazine, so oh, I got to get the Gold's Gym. Then soon Arnold's in the picture. Then Franco's in the picture. Then Zane is in the picture. And you got all these guys at Gold's Gym in Venice. So they, people around the world would come and they'd train there and they'd hang out and they'd hang out with the guys and we'd go eat at a, a restaurant down the street called The Germans. It was owned by a man or a boy. 
not he's a man and his sister, and they were German. She had hairy armpits, and she'd serve the omelet, and the hair on the armpits would hang over the plate. No. But she was hot looking, so the hair didn't matter. But it was an eight egg omelet with coffee, toast, and everything for $1.35. Eight egg omelet. Eight egg. Like a bodybuilder omelet. Exactly. So we would all get, eat there. We yeah. call it the Tomain Tavern because it was, looked like it was dirty, you know, but we all ate there. and. Um, this became part of the routine of training at Gold's Gym. Eating there, hanging out. Clint Eastwood came down there because a, a bodybuilder by the name of Dan Howard built him a sit-up bench. Right. So he came to pick it up and he says, well, I'm waiting. Where can I go eat? Someone said, go down to the Germans. And someone said, why would you send Clint Eastwood there? Well, because that's where we go. And he came back and said, oh man, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> so th these things made the gym popular. Um, and so people started coming out. And of course, they shot more and more footage in their training. And, and it was, just became one of those things. I remember Candace Bergen, yes. who was doing a lot for news, came in and shot a documentary. And I was in there one day. And she said, do you mind if I shoot you, um, <laughs> shoot me, take pictures of you for a thing I'm doing? I said, no, I don't mind. So she had me doing cable crossovers and dumbbells. And I've never seen those pictures. I don't even know how I would get them nowadays. It's been so long. But, um, oh man, Isaac Hayes came in there. Uh, a lot of famous people came in that gym to train. Um, just because they heard it was good. And they'd come in the back door, get out of their limo, and go back. Tommy Chong, Cheech and Chong. Oh, wow. Tommy trained, trained there forever. In fact, he'd loan me his, his RCA video camera with CCO2, a big camera like this, when my son was born, Adam, so I could take pictures for him on Right. So it was the, and he had a, he had a Jaguar, on, or Rolls Royce, I'm sorry, and on the license plate it said Humble. <laughs> he was just on that rewards thing to the night. But um, that was the Mecca, and that's what made it popular was, was Joe Gold and Joe Weider. And nowadays, in the Mecca bodybuilding in Venice, uh, there's not even a picture of Joe Gold up there. And if you were to ask the current member of the gym, who's Joe Gold? They don't know. They won't know, yeah. They have no clue. I mean, how can you not know who Joe Gold is? Correct. So they know Arnold, but, but the other thing is, is that when Joe sold the gym, first of all, I did the logo for them in 73, and then uh, a couple of owners took it, and then new owners took it, and then Pete Grimkowski and... Right. and um, uh, and, and Ed Connors and a couple of guys bought the gym and they started promoting contests sponsored by Joe Gold, by Gold's Gym. So the logo became big. It became the, the largest iconic logo in the world. And that was the emblem that made Gold's Gym famous. Yeah, but do you, you regret not having patented that Gold's Gym logo you know, and the World Gym logo? Yeah, you can't go back and change things, but today I'm, I'm benefit from it. But the thing is, is that, that that's what made the gym famous was the fact that it was doing contests, it was endorsing this, endorsing that. Yeah. The logo was, was, a, was a, a trademark that was seen everywhere. Correct. Everybody saw the logo, they knew what Gold's Gym. To this day, the Joe Gold came back into uh, the business in 76 out of the, the, as a merchant marine, and he was a little upset that he sold his name because he couldn't use it within a 10 mile radius. So we opened up World Gym right down the street, right across from my apartment, and owner Joe Gold. Right. And he came to me and he said, I need a logo. A lot of people know this, and so I drew him the gorilla. And that became uh, probably the second largest logo. Correct. And then he moved the gym three times, went in with Arnold in business, and then moved it again, franchised it. And now it's owned by the Camilleri brothers and their mother, um, uh, Joy, and they're all over the world. And they've done a real good job of recreating World Gym again and building it into a big franchise. They're good people, and they work real hard to make it something. And um, it's, it's nice. You know, they have certain standards they have to meet, and they've done a first-class job. Right. But they got rid of the World Gym right next to Gold's. Well, what happened was, was Joe had moved... He kept his, his building across from me as an office. He moved it to Brooks Avenue. It was a three-story building that became a gymnastic center. And then he moved into a Sizzler at Washington and Lincoln because the Sizzler went out of business. It's a steakhouse here in California. And that was, a, that was the World Gym. The thing with Joe is he had no music and he had certain rules and this is how he liked the gym. Well, Gold's has music. I don't mind the music. It keeps the beat going when I train. Right. It doesn't bother me in the least. And then Joe passed away in 2004 and no one is there to run the gym. Eddie and those guys didn't inherit it. Um, he left some things to certain people, and the gym just went belly up because it was owned by him, but it was maintained by the membership. So when he died, and, and the attorney said, now you guys are gonna have to stay, start paying your membership because there's no one to support the gym. They said, no, Joe never charged us. And he said, Joe's dead, You're, he's dead. He, 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 someone has to pay for it. Oh my God. So they didn't wanna pay for it, and they closed the gym down, that was it. Too bad. Sad because it was like a rooftop gym. It's just amazing. The original was a rooftop gym. The yeah. one on the scissor wasn't, but I mean, the, you couldn't beat it. You had the indoors and outdoors. Oh, and God. I could see it from my apartment building because I had a patio that I could look across the street, and there's the gym with the rooftop. And then if I look the other way about a block, there's the ocean. Right. I mean, for me, coming from a desert town and living on the beach for 165 a month, this is when I moved to a two bedroom, I had the ocean across the street, and I had the gym across the street. Correct. What more could I ask for? All right.
and people that went to Gold's Gym were not allowed to go to Gold's. Well, it, it was kind of like an unspoken word. You know, you don't go to Gold's if you go to World. You don't wear the World Gym shirt and the Gold's. I wore my World Gym t-shirts and the Gold's every day. But everybody knows I did the logo. I have every right to do so. I'm connected to both gyms by the logos. Right. You know, I, I, it's my family. That Gold's Gym is my family. World Gym is my family. It's the, the mother and the father. Correct. And maybe the in-laws don't get along, <laughs> but I'm in the middle, and don't right. put the kid in the middle of your marriage, <laughs> so to speak. All right. So um, it works out okay. So tell me, after the success of Pumping Iron in 1977, mm -hmm. you in conjunction with bodybuilding and wrestling, then what happened? You start doing commercials, <clears throat> you have a family, more children, what happened after that? Well, I moved from the beach, and I bought a house, this house here, 37 years ago in the valley. I did not want to move from the beach. I got married, and the last thing I wanted to do was move, and the last thing I really wanted to do was get married. Yeah. Um, because as far as I'm concerned in the, in the female world, I'm public domain. Everyone has rights to me. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. But um, I, I had a child, and we had to move, and we bought a house out here, which I don't regret, because the house I bought here is, it was $86,000. It's worth $650,000 now. Right, yeah. So it was a very good investment. It's down the street from all the studios, Universal, all the studios. It's in the mecca of the entertainment world in North Hollywood. I'm close to the North Hollywood Golds. Uh, I have a garage where I used to do all my silk ring. I used to shoot my show now that the studio is in the house. I have my ring in the backyard where I teach wrestling. Yeah. I have my office in there. <clears throat> my daughter lives with me. And it's a nice place to be. But it was you being the entrepreneur. Who well, well, the thing is, is that there's a lot of bodybuilders, and people say, "I want to be a bodybuilder." You'll never make any money in bodybuilding. Right. Arnold did. That's one person. There's a few that make a few bucks here and there in endorsements, but for the most part, you've got to take it to somewhere where you know you can work with it. Right. And and I'm not. I was never a, a, a Mr. Olympia. I trained with the guys. I had a good body, as good as any of them. But my thing was wrestling. So if I'm going to build my body, well, I got a few trophies in the garage, but. A wrestling titles and income and wrestling a paycheck every week was much better to me than bodybuilding. Although I'm in my diehard heart, I'm a bodybuilder. Correct. <clears throat> so I used the wrestling and the bodybuilding for what I do, which got me into stunt work. And then I got an incredible Hulk playing the middle Hulk between Betsy That's and right. Ferrigno. Yeah. So Louis set me up for it. I got the job. That has a certain following called the Demi Hulk at Comic Con. They love this character for some reason, um, and I didn't know that was going to happen. I. I I never knew that my career was going to be what it was because I did it out of a passion. It wasn't about, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money. I never think, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money, so I'm going to do this. I just do it because I like it. But if you like something well enough, you'll make money at it Correct. because eventually it'll come your way. I mean, I got pictures that were share, pictures of Frigno, West Cigarettes I did three years in, yeah. in Germany, uh, May West last movie, Sex Debt. I got pictures with all the guys over there, my Hulk makeup. Correct. But these are all things that I just took with a grain of salt. I did Wild Wild West. I mean, all these different shows, I can go on, but I forget most of them. And those are things that, that there's a thing, there's a thing that, called the dash, it's a poem. And when you die, and I heard at Hardball Haggerty's funeral, they had a female minister and she read the dash. If you look it up on Google, look up the dash. It's from the time you were born to the time you die. And it's a poem about what you did in those years in between. And those years in between are the dash on your gravestone. That's your dash. That's where you set your tone for your life and what you've become. So I wanted to know that someday when I pass away, that dash will hold all the things I've done in history. I need to leave a legacy. I need my kids to know that I've accomplished something. And um, it's a big dash. Yeah, but you're sharing your legacy through this Rick's Corner. I am. At the gym, every day people come up and interrupt you, and they want to say hello and yeah. meet you. Yeah, you know, and then you teach wrestling to the children in the backyard. Yeah, and yeah. Then you're just living the dream, and you're really, really happy. You never really had a, a nine to five job. No, I have a twenty four seven job. Yeah, <laughs> um, I like people. I, there's some people I don't like, particularly when they're rude. Right. But people stop me all the time as if they did this morning too over at Starbucks, and I always give them the time of day and talk. I find people interesting. I've learned a lot from listening to people. When you listen, you learn. And everybody has some sort of a, a opinion about something, which I like to listen to. It may not agree with mine, but certainly I'll learn from it. Um, I think that's part of life is, is getting to know people. And don't judge a book by its cover because there's some people I see that I think, oh, I don't think I like that person. And I get to know them. They're like the nicest person I ever met. So I don't judge people anymore. I just kind of like take what's there and, and go with it. Um, yeah, I get interrupted a lot. You know, working an eight to five job I did once, a couple of times I worked at the bank. I worked for Kellogg's and it was very unproductive to me. And so when you worked at Kellogg's, didn't you work with Jim Morris too? Yeah, I got him a job at Carnation doing the oh, same see, thing. Yeah, he, he wanted that job and he got it and he liked it. But I, I don't know, I was never one to be structured into an eight to five job working for somebody else and they're making the money and I'm doing the labor. 
So I stepped outside the box. That's really hard to do for a lot of you guys. How do I do that? How do I get out of my regular job and not have an income and try something that I don't know if it's going to make it or, or break it? I just f never knew. I never knew the world would fail. I just always felt like I'm going to accomplish this and this is what it's going to be. I took up guitar. I became one of the best guitar players in the band of Bakersfield. I got a deal with Capitol Records. I taught guitar and I taught myself how to play and even read music. But I knew I could do it. I, same with the wrestling, I knew I could do it. And same with body, I knew I could do it. And I don't know no. When someone tells me no, bullshit, I can do it. Correct. Yeah. So um, even at my age now, I mean, yeah, I move a little slower. I got a little more injury. It's a little harder to get up in the morning. But I don't care. I go to I go to the gym. I'm in pain. I work through the pain. I do my day. And you still lift a lot of weight for your age. And you're well, dedicated. Six days lift, a week. Yeah, I don't lift as much as I used to. I can, but I don't yeah. see any reason to. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I think you just got to go for the gold. You live one life, and I said this before. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the play. This is the the three act play. So you're not rehearsing for it. You're going through it. And if you don't do all three acts and do it to your best, you're not going to be able to be hired to do the play again. Correct. Yeah. Right. It's it's just it's it's your performance, and this is what counts. And don't put off for tomorrow for what you can do today, because tomorrow never comes. Right. Right. Oh, one day I'll get around to it. My mom said that she died at 97. Guess what? She never got around to it. One day I will. No, you didn't. You never did. Yeah. And I love my mom, and she was the best, but she was a procrastinator, and that's something I never wanted to be. So um, I don't. I mean, there's some things I put on the back burner that aren't important, like doctors, because <laughs> right. I don't want to go. But for the most part, I get everything done in a day, and then tomorrow's a whole new list. I make a list of everything I have to accomplish throughout every day, and I go by that list to make sure everything's checked off. It's a checklist. And then I go to the new day. And so if you want to take a chance in life and you want to have a passion, Take it upon yourself to do it on the side to start with, and when it starts to grow into where you feel that you can make yourself a living from it, drop the thing you don't like you're doing. And if a woman tells you, and wives do this, and girlfriends, you can't quit that job, you need that job, blah, 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 blah. You know what? Be a man and do what you got to do. Right. I never listened to a woman tell me. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I love my girlfriend. She's the best in the world. She's awesome. She's successful. She's everything I've ever wanted in a human being to be, and she's inspired me even more to go farther. So I take what she says, and I listen to it, and I do it. She's not telling me to be rude. She's not telling me to put me down. She's telling me to make me better, and I know that. It's out of love, and so I work hard to be better. Right? Right, right. right. But even today, you know, you're perhaps one of the few remaining people that are willing to come out and talk about the golden era of bodybuilding. Yeah. How many people have you talked to to come on your show and they refuse <clears> to come out? <throat> well, there's several that I won't name names that want $2,000 to come sit here. What? Because they don't have any money. And uh, there's another certain someone who won't even answer my emails, a very well known bodybuilder. He doesn't care. He wants to do his own thing. I don't know why. Uh, I know them well, but they're, they're, I don't know what's wrong with them. But you're passing this information for free on YouTube and you get 22 million followers. Yeah. They hang on your every word. Yeah. Do you think that all publicity will do them good? Yeah, but if you, of course it would do them good. Yeah. Any bodybuilder that I trained with back then, uh, you know, Platt and Zane, I mean, I don't want to name names, <laughs> but these guys should come on here and, and be seen because everyone wants to see them. Why they don't come on? One wants money, the other one doesn't talk. So I don't get it. You know, I mean, it's like uh, they're, they're past their prime. They need attention. They don't get it anywhere. They can get it on here. We can talk about good stuff in old times, and it would be fun. I spoke to Arnold a few weeks ago at, yes. at, at, at the funeral. I mentioned to him that I want to talk to him about this. I know he's doing The Apprentice. He doesn't have a lot of time. But if I can pin him down just for a half hour somewhere and just talk about some stuff, it would be great. People ask for him, but he's hard to pin down. I get that. He's a busy guy. Yeah. Um, Franco Colombo, I'd like to get, but you know, I, I don't know. He doesn't. He doesn't talk so much. Doesn't talk much, and he doesn't really show up on time. So there's these obstacles I have. Ken Laura, I might do with a Skype guy like Ken. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. um, they're just they're they're out there, and then there are some that just don't want to go on camera. There, they don't like how they look today. You know, it's just what it is. Sound. Yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad. Well, you continue to promote it and make a living through the books that you've published, like Bodybuilding for <coughs> Dumbbells. Yeah, that's a basic book. The Wikipedia of steroids. That's a basic book. Tells yeah. you what to use and what not to use. I can't say legally what to take because people ask me, well, what should I take? How many cycles? I don't know. I don't know you and I don't know what your body chemistry is like, but you should have a blood test and find out first. Uh, I always stick, for my age now, I stick with one cc of testosterone a week. I'm not afraid to talk about it. My body doesn't produce it. At my age, doesn't produce it. I take one cc, I feel great. I take a little thyroid because my thyroid's low, I feel great. I just had a blood test back, cholesterol, blood pressure, lipitoids, uh, everything down the whole chain of blood tests was normal. There wasn't one thing out of line. All right. So I'm glad of that. 
blood pressure was like perfect. I, I'm yeah. just amazed. I don't even take pills for it. Right. right. So yeah, my eating's clean. I do train, as you know, hard. Yeah. Um, I and do. You're still clean up to this day. Yeah, I had turkey and cottage mm. cheese for lunch. There you go. Um, I like carrot cake. Yeah. I like lemon cake. I like ice cream. And I'll do it in moderation once in a while. My girlfriend likes ice cream every night, so I'll have a couple of bites, and after a couple of bites, I'm done. However, you guys know when you're younger, you can eat a whole... Ken Waller used to eat a whole gallon at night. The whole thing. You'd eat the whole thing. I can never do that. Of course, if you keep it in front of you, chip away at it, you know it's all gone, right? So I put a certain amount in a bowl and say, that's it, no more. Right. Last night, we had a lemon cake, and I kept cutting it. Guys, take it away. Right. Because I'm going to cut through this whole cake right. before I know right. it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to be careful how you do it. But um, your training's going good. Yes. And I like working out with you. Right. I, <laughs> well, I used to um, work out with other guys, but ever since I started working out with you, you kept insisting on less weight and focus on the muscle and squeeze and yeah. feel the tension yeah. and do higher reps, higher yeah. volume. Exactly. And I do see more results because of it. My joints don't hurt. Yeah. And, but you're lucky. Yeah. Because I do have a joint problem. And, and for all of you that, uh, I'm a lot of you guys, oh, you're not as big as you used to be. I'm um, 223. That's big enough for me. Uh, I've lost some iron size, arms, iron side, iron size, because I have a pinched nerve in my neck and shoulder, and I have carpal tunnel in my hand. I just took the leg uh, brace off here, but I've had cortisone injections today in here and on a cyst. And what happens is the nerve that runs down affects my arm. Uh -huh. So my arm doesn't grow like it did, it, and I have a ripped tricep that came off. So this arm, which used to be bigger, is actually smaller than this side. Right. But what are you going to do? It happens with age. You know. No, you still work out, and he has not lost his artistic ability to draw <coughs> something like this, of which well, I have a copy. I have a hard time with that because these fingers are numb right now no. from the carpal tunnel, but I do draw these. They're on my website. You can buy one, frame it on the wall as a piece of history. So if you want one, go on there and send me a, 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 an order for it through PayPal. I'll sign it to you and I'll dress it and yeah. send it off to you and you can put it on your wall as a piece of history. Iconic. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. Also, I want to mention, you know, we didn't have trainers back in those days. That's right. You no one had trainers. Uh, Zebo trained Elvis Presley uh, on the side, but there were no trainers. And today we have a lot of trainers. And a lot of you guys write in and tell me you're becoming a trainer, becoming a trainer. Well, trainers need to be certified. And the best place that I've found, with a lot of friends on there, is NASA, National Academy of Sports Medicine. They will certify you to become a trainer. That's right. And they're one of the best in the business. Actually, they're number one from what I've told. Uh, now they're offering viewers on my website 14 day. Uh, online CP certification, so it's free, 14 day for certification on National Academy of Sports Medicine. Take a look at it, go to myusatrainer.com slash Rick, look at the details, see what it is, see what they offer for the 14 days. If it's free, give it a shot. If you want to become a trainer, it's worth it because uh, I see so many trainers doing things wrong in the gym. Oh my God, I don't even want to start on that. Uh, I mean, horrendous things with their clients and that's why they're not getting any, any better what they do. But go to uh, NASA and, and check it out. Uh, myusatrainer.com slash Rick. They'll get the 14 day free trial and certification, and maybe it's for you. I mean, I, I, I believe in them. I think they're a good company, and everybody who's come on here has been certified by them. Right. So um, I'm all for it. It's on my web, it's on my show today. You'll see how to click on it. I'd like to say it's a pleasure working out with you because it brings <coughs> me back to the days when Arnold first met Reg Park. And when I started yeah. working out, I got so excited, like a little child. And at your age, you can really push some weight. Yeah, no, and no. you'll keep on lifting and lifting until the day you, you're gone. You'll well, never... Reg Park's son, John John, yeah. who I met a couple of years ago. I just saw him last week, two weeks ago. I need to interview John John, but he has a gym in Culver City and he can't get over here. So I need to get over there at 11 o'clock in the morning, which is really hard on the 405 freeway. Yes, it is. But I know that John John has a lot of stories about Reg and, and Arnold back in the day, and he's willing to do it. So I am going to get him on the show. I'm sure you have a lot of funny stories about Arnold, which are a bit um, X-rated. Well, there's things I won't see on the air. Uh, Will Jim also sponsors me, and Will Jim, as yes. you can see, uh, has an ambassadorship for people that travel around, and they do seminars, and they have um, workout videos on their website once a week, the chest workout, back, body, all different body parts. So I'm going to have that in my description. You can click on that and see their videos. I've seen a few of them. They're pretty good. They're, they're very informative, and I think they're doing a nice job. This is what I like about World Gender, staying ahead of the game, and they're having current stuff available on the website. You can watch and get the first-hand knowledge and everything, and then I also am an ambassador for them, and I speak for them as well. So uh, there's a lot of knowledge out there. I, I, I enjoy what I do. I love being on this show. Um, I love having friends like Ilya that we share a lot of in common and I share a lot in common with all of you and we just want to make you guys the best that you can possibly be by this knowledge. So those that write in that tell me that I'm an old man and don't know anything, if that's what you want to think, go ahead. But 
I know more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> and also, look at this shirt. Oh, that's my new design. Don't bug me when I'm training. Yeah. <laughs> it's available on bodybuilding.com. I, it. I made this design oh, many years ago and I revamped it again because people were coming up to my workout and say, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, no, don't bug me. And I made the shirt. Yeah. Well, I thought that would keep them away. No, I didn't keep them away. They wanted to oh, bite off me. He's wearing sunglasses. <laughs> they wanted to bite off me, so I decided to mass market them again. Don't bug me when I'm training. I can say don't bug me when I'm eating, don't bug me when I'm having sex, don't bug me when I'm digesting. <laughs> we can go through a whole series of don't bug me, which actually just now gave me an idea that I might do that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Ilya. Well, Red, oh, no, thank pleasure. you for having me on your show. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many more questions, but we're going to run out of time. Well, we'll do number two. Okay. Uh, you want to close it out and say what you say? Um, I just want to say it's a privilege, and though I'm not a, a huge fitness bodybuilder celebrity um, I'm just a, a fan and I know a lot about bodybuilding I know about the old-timers and well, no offense so when I see Rick who is like a thesaurus uh, you know literally we can talk about hours on end about bodybuilding it makes my day and uh, thank you for watching um, thank you guys and um, we'll see you next time bye-bye <laughs> Drayson.com. He is the equalizer, baby. See you next time.